Ah, the wonder of video games. They let you discover worlds you could never hope to live in. Build bonds with different species, take part in complex combat mechanics, and experience stories you probably couldn't come up with unless you were abusing Dr. Phil's secret stash of methamphetamine. You sure got me figured out. They can let you vicariously live out your wildest fantasies. Just watch as I pick up this pretty lady. Hey, beautiful. Did you want to? Sorry, but I'm busy now. Sorry. Bye now. Okay, well, let's move on to the next one. Hey, good looking. What do you say, you, me? Huh? Who the hell you think you are? Come on, there's more to the world than this. What about my badass job? But first, I gotta make the bus. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, god damn it! I swear, every day. It's my first day on the job, and I'm sure it'll be a wonderful experience that I won't soon forget. Just moving this crate here, and this crate here. This job sucks. Ah, finally. A little bit of the bubbly! But first, I have to wait for the store to open. Hey, stuck waiting too, huh? Don't you wish there was a way to speed this up? Okay. Welcome to the world of Shenmue. A game that you have likely heard of because of the unprecedented step that it took for the open world genre. It's the story of the human struggle. Love. I wish time would just stand still. Racism. Hey, my lunch! Pain. Ow! Oh. Sexual harassment. Get away from Don't me! Don't fight it, babe. We'll be gentle. And the unethical nature of inbreeding. <laughs> Here, you take on the role of Ryu Hazuki. As with every adolescent of the 80s, Ryu is out looking for his father's killer. Ah, revenge. A tale as old as Kratos himself. I will have my fruitcake. The story is basically on that day when the snow turned to rain, Ryo was coming home from God knows what because he sure as hell doesn't care about school. But when he gets home, he finds his undead zombie surf, I mean slave, I mean housekeeper, Ine-san, and 24 chromosome peer Fuku-san on the ground outside of the family dojo after they were beaten the hell up. By Chinese people. When Ryo enters the dojo, his father is brutally murdered right in front of his eyes by a master of martial arts named Lan Di, who had come for an enigmatic ancient mirror. Now after sitting Shiva for four days, Ryo is on a quest for revenge as well as trying to uncover the mystery of the mirror his father was given the Uncle Ben treatment for. Unfortunately, after this engrossing opening cinematic, you are immediately introduced to one of your most formidable adversaries in the entire game. Tight spaces. Moving around in your home is kind of a pain with this control scheme. Maybe if the damn surf knew how to build a damn house correctly. But thankfully, after leaving your home, the environments become much more capacious, which the controls are more well-tuned for. The environments are all visually appealing to look at, but there's barely any use of the first couple of locations you enter after the initial time that you walk through them. For example, the first location is just a residential area, so lots and lots and lots of apartments that you can't walk into. All there really is for you to do here is talk to a little girl who's helping a kitten after its mother was hit by a car. And boy does she have some of the darndest things to say. My big sister saw it! She said it was a big black car! The next location has a few more things to do than the first one. It has more landmarks like a park, a construction zone, a convenience store. Use your head, baby boy, do you? Yes. <laughs> Kids playing in the streets asking me to play sports with them. Hey, mister! Let's play baseball! Kid, I'll f you up. Here, you could start collecting toy capsules. You could ask around if anything strange happened on the day that Ryo's father got the soul slapped the f*** out of him, and help a sweet old lady find a house. 
Aw, so sweet. Any of you f***ing pricks move! And I'll execute every mother f***ing last one of you! The next location of Dabuita is the most densely populated area, and it's where you'll spend most of your time in the game. And honestly... It's freaking wonderful, because this is where Shenmue really comes to life. It really feels like a living small town with a populace that all have a day and night cycle. The fish seller has times where he is on break so he has his wife run the shop in his stead. Ah, isn't that cute? Make your wife stay home until you want lunch. And the patriarchy. I think that's a neat detail that shows how much they went above and beyond in certain ways to make the NPCs feel alive. I'm afraid it's dangerous! No loitering allowed! Sentient, I tell you. The character models look amazing for that time period. Just look at Ryo and his cute little bandage, which never comes off. In the past 20 years, since the game pretty much takes place in December, the NPCs will wear heavier clothes since it's pretty close to Christmas. Or if it rains, they will use umbrellas. Except for Nozomi, who always wears this tight miniskirt even at night when it's snowing. Like, damn, girl. <laughs> What's wrong with you? There's a large variety of stores that you can walk into even though many of them feel superfluous in number. But that just gives the world another realistic detail. By the end of my 20 hour experience, I actually knew where all of the stores were by heart. And all of these factors fostered a town that had a personality that in my opinion makes it in a few ways more memorable than the destinations of its sequel. As well as providing a great example of why having such large open worlds doesn't necessarily make it better. An impressive feature is that on top of that, you can speak with literally every person you see, which sounds like a stupendous feat for that time period, even if most of the things they say are very outlandish. Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you mocking me? Ryu can also interact with a lot of the things in his environment, like making phone calls or picking up items and then making a comment about their utility. For example, Ryo can pick up vases and move them around to see what secrets they contain. Hello! Okay, time to go back. In a way to stay true to the culture of Japan, Ryo can approach the family's Buddhist altar and pray for his deceased father's soul. It's evident that the developers of Shenmue went above and beyond to make this the forefront of gaming technology, to make it feel as realistic as possible with its attention to detail, which in a lot of ways makes it a great experience. Now let's get into exactly what you do in Shenmue. Well, the crux of it is a lot of walking around town, mainly in Debueta, and asking people questions that would make Cole Phelps blush with stupidity. How the shrunken head it was used to tamper with your car? You see, I normally don't drive off cliffs. Mr. McAfee, you're lying. This is where we get into one of the most notorious dubs ever placed inside of a video game, with script writing and voice acting which ranges on a scale of holy sh this is terrible. So holy sh this is terrific. Lee terrible. What? Are you looking for a fight? I mean it when I say that everyone that you speak to sounds like they just came from a Quaalude session at a 1970s disco nightclub. It's can't be dumb, but it's extremely charming. The game doesn't hold your hand with where you should go. Instead, you and Ryo need to figure that out for yourselves by interacting with the people around you. It can be extremely entertaining to hear some of the out-of-this-world dialogue that these NPCs have. Just listen to some of these wise words. Seem a bit blue, my man? Got a problem? Then I'm your man! Think you can bump into me and not even apologize? Yeah, jerk! Apologize to Enoki-san! Sorry, man! I'm kind of busy now! Give my regards to Tao-san. Sure thing. I'll say hi for you. I'll say hi for you. What the f***? It's hilarious watching Ryo go up to people and ask him if they know any Chinese people. Not all Chinese people are bad. You. Like, who does that? 
I mean, if I was going to go around town asking anyone anything like this, they would look at me a little cross-eyed. But we do what we must for revenge. I got a <laughs> and don't forget the famous meme that every gamer over the age of 23 knows. I'm looking for sailors. Do you know anywhere sailors go to hang out? You know where the sailors hang out around here? The reason the series is able to get away with such a strange mechanic is because it fits in such a strange world. Like how a character like Goofy can fit in basically every Disney cartoon, but not something like Schindler's List. The series was able to craft such a strange culture that it became easy to see why it gathered such a cult following even after the series ended for nearly 20 years. And when you aren't questioning erudite bikers on the meaning of life, you are doing QTEs which are indigenous to this franchise and are shockingly done extremely well. Or you're beating up shady looking people with your martial arts prowess. The combat most of the time feels very stimulating, but it still is worth pointing out that the combat does still have its fair share of issues, which generally include the camera. If you're fighting in a narrow area, it might be hard to see exactly what your opponent is doing because Ryo is blocking your vision of them. Or maybe you can't see what your opponent is doing on screen because of the camera and then all of a sudden they give a figurative RKO out of nowhere. But that's not to say that this diminishes the experience, and if anything the combat is the best part of the entire game. Have you pretty tough? There are a plethora of combos available for you to master with more being obtainable by buying them at the antique store or by being trained by the magical trope of old wise people being martial arts masters. I'll eat whatever is in this homeless man's garbage bags if you get my drift. It also gets challenging in the later parts of the game when there are multiple enemies that really, really love to block your attacks. So make sure you understand how fighting works. Okay! Especially the blocking button because you do not want to have to participate in the 70 man battle royale again. This guy is an asshole. I would say overall that 75% of this game is just asking people questions. Now while it is very entertaining to see what stupid things people are going to say, it does become humdrum after so many hours. So to alleviate this issue, in the last third of the game, the harbor is open for you to explore. Which brings up another point about how different Shenmue is from other open world experiences. And in what way is it like that? Well, my dear viewer, dear viewer, let me tell you. It lets you experience the bewildering horrors of real life adulthood. <laughs> Jokes aside, the job at the harbor was actually pretty entertaining to play. For a little while. It was fun to turn off the creative parts of my brain and get as many crates as possible to their designated warehouses so I can beat quota and get a pay raise for the next day and get more money that I will never use. And on top of that, we get one of the cheekiest minigames I've ever played. And of course, I'm talking about the iconic forklift racing. Honestly, the driving is pretty horrendous. Like, why is touching the edge of these extremely narrow pathways allowed to stop me in my tracks? And why are other cars allowed to knock me into the wall, but when I do it to them, I just get knocked into the wall again? The world may never know. But still, this just oozed how much it owns its campiness. Just listen to the music. I love this silliness. But I would say that, like, the main part of the game where you just ask people questions, I feel these segments also get really repetitive after the first couple of days of just dragging crates around for what in real time is actually around 30 minutes. And you do this for like five in-game days. So that's a lot of time that you're going to be spending picking up and moving these damn crates. Like, I'm already miserable with one job in my real life. Why do I need to have one in my virtual one too? This makes me feel even worse about the forklift racing because even though I don't like spending two and a half hours of my life picking up crates, they are a part of the normal day and moves the story forward. But the forklift races at the beginning of every day just feel extra. And they always start off with the same unskippable cutscene. No, stop! 
stop it. This gets old faster than Harvey Weinstein's legs in the past year. Now, that's not the only negatives I have, and oh boy, oh boy, do I have some that really ruin the experience, if you don't have a vast reserve of patience. No! The worst of which is, ironically, a factor that makes Shenmue stand out over other open-world games. And that's its attempts to be as realistic as humanly possible. This is from its reliance on its daily schedules, which doesn't sound like a problem since other open-world games have these. However, where it becomes an issue is that you aren't given the chance to fast-forward in time at all, so the game actually forces you to continue playing in parts where there is pretty much nothing to do. One example of this is when you are trying to meet Charlie. You find out that this finger-biting son of a bitch is gonna be around the jacket store at 7pm at night. That doesn't sound like a problem, I'll just go, oh god, it's 12. And since there is a lack of anything substantial for you to do the entire day, you'll just be spending the entire time running around in figure eight. And when you get to 7pm, you get into a fight with a guy that isn't Charlie. And when you beat him up, he says Charlie is at the tattoo parlor. And when you get to the tattoo parlor to meet this bastard, the owner says that the store is closed, even though the sign outside says that it isn't and that you have to be back tomorrow to meet him. Charlie! Charlie, where are you going? So after doing nothing the entire day until 7 p.m., I now have to wait again. A normal game would have you fast forward in time by going to bed, or smoking a cigar, or meditating, or watching an episode of The Flash, which will also put you to bed. But this game doesn't let you do that. Oh no! You'll have to keep playing the entire day until 8 p.m., which is when the game gives you the opportunity to go to sleep, and you're gonna like it. And then you wake up at 8.30 in the morning, and you'll have to still wait until the store opens at 2 p.m. It makes playing this game really vexing. Damn it! I have had hours where I just laid my controller down and just did something else while I waited for this game to decide to give me the absolute pleasure of continuing the story. This sucks. There's nothing charming about this. And there's just not enough that you can really do other than go to an arcade to play like three or four mini games that take a minute to play. What the f is that? Or practice your martial arts. <laughs> not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? I mean, we're talking about practice. The game wants you to practice, but I never felt like it was absolutely necessary to do. I suck at fighting games, but I managed to do this game without practicing. And expect this issue to occur quite often. As you could probably tell with a game where you spend a majority of your day asking people questions, there is going to be a lot of poorly paced parts especially the beginning of your journey. You'll be hoping to get into combat or a QTE or the sweet icy grip of death, which can be a nice change of pace. Power! But literally anything could be a better change of pace from a walk-in question simulator for hours. But thankfully, it feels like it picks up the more you go along with the story and you are introduced to more interesting characters who will help you understand what you need to continue your investigations, like Master Chen and Gui Zhang. But then the pacing falls again when you get sick of your job at the harbor. Like I said before, the forklift job starts off fine because it's a charming new mechanic you're learning. But like many other parts of the game, it becomes ad nauseum. You'll have to spend entire days doing this job so that you can get one cutscene and fight sequence during the day and then do nothing for the rest of it. Even if you do the sequence earlier in the day, like lunchtime, the game still forced me to stay around during the night to keep investigating. Fortunately, after your final day at the harbor, this is where the game really picks up and it's smooth sailing from there as the story culminates in a satisfying climax. In its fantastic final hours, I was given the pleasure of seeing all of Rio's investigations come together and leave off on a great cliffhanger to, in my mind, is an objectively better sequel. The presentation caught me by surprise by how stellar it actually was. It's nice to just walk around town. The environments are pretty, and for some reason I have this strange affinity with De Buita, that I actually wouldn't mind visiting this location in real life, if I actually had the money to go. 
The cinematography, oh my god, the cinematography during the cutscenes can be freaking amazing. For example, when it turns to night, you see these beautiful views of the location that you're in. There is also Rio's dreams where we see some very engrossing imagery. The quick time events made me feel like I was actually a part of some great action scenes, unlike games like Resident Evil 4 which seemed like they just had them shoehorned in for no reason other than to just say, hey, you paying attention? there? I was really shocked by how well made these cutscenes looked, which was only bolstered by the beautiful soundtrack that they blended it with, which I honestly think still holds up to today's standards. Just opening up your journal is cool here. Out of all the games I've played throughout my life, this probably has the best soundtrack that I've ever heard. Now let's get into the characters. Ryo is a one-track mind kind of person. He never really expresses himself to anyone and pushes everyone he can away except for those that he feels he can get information out of. I mean, is the idea behind it bad? No, his father was just killed, I understand that. It's just that throughout the entirety of the game, he never really changes much. I feel like he's the same person at the beginning of the game as he is at the end. But that might have been on purpose because he's supposed to develop, I guess, what was supposed to be over an entire series. Nevertheless, it would have been nice if he let down his guard a bit more. He shows barely any interest in anything other than revenge which can make him appear quite insipid. Though that doesn't mean that he's a bad person at all. He saves people whenever they are in need, like when he helps a boy get his ball back from a bunch of thugs. <laughs> or when Mark was getting the Disney Star Wars treatment. It's just that through his interactions with people, I was hoping that he would express his personality more, but instead he makes everyone seem like a stranger and it turns him into quite an unrelatable person. I would say that there are maybe two people he has a bond with by the end. The first person being Nozomi. I mean, she needs to pry Ryo's emotions out with a Godzilla-sized wrench, but she gets it out at times. Which is the reason why I consider her to be the most important side character in the game. She does what she can to make sure Ryo is alright. Ryo! Hmm? Cheer up, will ya? His father was murdered four days ago, what do you mean cheer up? She cares for him and he cares for her. You could see that Ryo doesn't want her to get involved with his dangerous escapades and it breaks her heart because she doesn't... Oh Jesus Christ, I'm describing a soap opera. The other person who I would actually say builds a relationship with Ryo rather than having it already established is Guizang who appears kind of like a kindred spirit who is also a prodigy of martial arts. He does what he can to aid Ryo as well as try to get him to go all out against him, like a great rival would. He protect and attack. There are other side characters too, as I mentioned before, the reluctant friend Fukusan, who really, really doesn't want to help Ryo because if he ever left the house, he wouldn't know how to cross the street before looking both ways. There's also the wonderfully hilarious and beautiful Goro. God, he is amazing. <laughs> this wannabe member of the Tunnel Snakes is the epitome of a lovable jackass. Oh, bro! Didn't I ask you not to say that so loud? There's Tom, your average African-American with a Jamaican accent stereotype, who was also voiced by a white guy. Sorry, man. And Schmeagel from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Though they really are not well written, like, at all, they are a colorful cast of characters and I never found myself bored of them. 20 years ago, when Shenmue first came out, it was considered one of the best in the industry. While there are more dramatic, well-written, and definitely better acted games, I still think that it somewhat holds up in its own quirky way. There's a lot to like about it, but just don't go into this thinking that it's going to be this philosophically life-changing experience. It's really simple. It's pretty lighthearted most of the time, which honestly fits someone like me who doesn't like it when there is always something of urgency around the corner. It's a silly game that's at times a lot of fun to follow, and I would recommend playing it at least once. 
Shenmue is a good experience that fostered many innovative ideas that continue to this day. But at the same time, there are so many things that hold it back to the year of 1999 when it came out. Like I said before, sometimes it is fun to play, but most of the time it is just a chore to go through. Like it's at times absolutely horrendous pacing, it's monotonous main activity of running around and asking people questions, or it's lack of implementing of any ability to speed up time until hours after I finish what I did for the day. Nevertheless, through all of its faults, I still say that this is the most unique open world game I've ever played by having one of the most realistic locations I've ever been in. That's why I give it a 3 out of 5.